Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with David Chislett. David is a weapon of mass creation. Yes. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Awesome to be here. So the first question has to be, how does one arrive at becoming a weapon of mass creation? Well, according to me, all human beings are already creative it's part of what makes us intelligent. It's part of what makes us conscious. Um, so to become a weapon of mass creation requires you to acknowledge that and embrace it and then expand and practice. Right. And you've obviously had uh, many creative expressions, right, in your life leading up to this point. Um, yeah. So just tell us a little bit about the background in some of the ways you've expressed your creativity. Right. Well, I've been self-employed for nearly 30 years, which alone requires an enormous amount of creativity. Um, on a, on, a, on a, a more sort of traditional arts kind of thing, I'm a poet. I've published a book of poetry. I'm a writer. I write short stories. I've been in bands. Uh, I play bass and I sing badly. Um, and I've, I've been a band manager, run promotions company, PR agencies, specializing in entertainment and music clients, worked in book publishing and published a, a number of books. Um, yeah, so a lot of my life has revolved around work in the entertainment industry itself. Um, and most of the time that I've been busy in those spheres, I've also been running my own business and setting that up and trying to figure out how on earth <laughs> to make it a viable business out of these fairly niche interests that I've always had. Right. And, and what is that business? <laughs> <laughs> well, the business now is completely different from, from everything else I've done before. Um, now I am a speaker and a trainer, and my focus is purely on bringing the message of creativity to more people with the aim of helping people understand that if you activate your creativity, you can take control of your destiny and um, generate your own options so that you really do have freedom of choice instead of just cherry picking all the, the corporate options that are presented to you by mainstream marketing and media. Right. Um, but aren't you selling that to people within corporations? <laughs> Does that not scare the hell out of corporations? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> everyone, Mike, do your workshop and leave immediately. Well, absolutely. I, and, and that is, of course, part of the agenda because corporations are part of the problem. Um, and I think what is happening now is that things are just moving so fast that if, if we continue to run our world and our businesses along corporate lines where everything is measured and monitored and assigned a value and split up into discrete little units without ever acknowledging the fundamental interconnectedness, like it's all an open system, you can't measure and, and monitor absolutely every part because it's so connected to the next part and you know create that's what creativity is all about it's about stepping into the gray ambiguous spaces between things and acknowledging that it can't always be a hundred percent clear cut and technology weirdly has brought us to the stage where if we're going to go to the next level we need to let go of all this mechanistic one plus one equals two way of conducting our lives and, and running our businesses. Right. So you so part of your agenda is encouraging people to leave corporate structures. Not necessarily. Um, my, a big part of my agenda is encouraging people to reform corporate structures so that they are more effective and nicer places to work. Okay. All right. And Okay, so and then of course, you know, the answer to the question, how do we do that? Of course, yeah, it's uh, a very long answer. But it's a long answer with many facets. But well, I suppose, where do you start with with that? Then you know, uh, reforming corporate structures. Where I've chosen to start is by talking about creativity and by letting people know that even when you walk, work in a big corporate where you do essentially the same thing every single day doesn't make you any less a creative person because you are solving problems every single day. Every meeting you go to has a problem and someone's got to be creative enough to come up with an answer for it. 
And so I focus on explaining to people how that actually works and what your brain's actually doing and what that means you can also do. And once you understand that the preconditions for creative thinking involve things like not thinking too hard, having internal quiet, and being slightly happy, you begin to see immediately how a lot of modern management techniques kind of run afoul of this. And the starting point for me is, is getting people into a mindset where they understand that in actual fact, we need to have more spaces, we need to have more downtime, we need to have less screens, we need to have less reporting so that people have actually got time to think. Right. So say that again. So it's a bit, a little bit happy, quiet. And what was the, the first one? Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's four things. Four things. One, yes. The, the one thing is that you need to have mental quiet. So not physical quiet. You can be in a, a noisy room, but you mustn't be thinking about too many things at once. So typically we're, you know, we're, we're thinking about, oh, am I doing the right thing? How are people going to see this? Blah, blah, blah. That's not mental quiet. The second one is that you need to be slightly inwardly focused, you know, so busy with your own stuff, with what's going on uh, inside your own head with the information you already have and how you feel about it and how you connect to it. The third one is you need to be slightly happy, which not everybody is at work. And the fourth one is that you mustn't try too hard because if you try too hard, you think too much, the mental quiet goes out the window, you're no longer inwardly looking and you're probably not very happy. Right, okay. And that's, and that's the, the essence of your training, is it, for people who want to become more creative? Actually, yes. I mean, you don't need me to uh, pop up in front of you or your, or, your, or your company to understand that. I mean, this is what the scientific research has revealed is the sort of fundamental mind state that's no, needed for people to be able to engage in creative thinking. And there are lots of different ways that you can get there. And that's a lot of what I talk about, um, as well as the tools and tricks that you can then use once you're in that state. What do you do with it? Right, right. And, and this, even this term creative is an interesting one and in how it's used, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I, I also done a lot of work in the in entertainment industry and we, we tend to reserve that term and we, we, we label people as creatives, right? They're the yes. creatives, which of yes. course means I'm not a creative. Um, so how do you approach just a word and people's relationship to it? Well, you know, <laughs> when I started all of this adventure three years ago, I, I stopped using the word creativity for a while because people inevitably assume I'm talking about art right. of some kind. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not, I, well, I'm not creative as a common Right, because I, I, don't, I don't write, I don't paint, I don't play guitar, I don't jump on a stage, so I can't possibly be creative. Um. But in fact, art is a, is a product of this thing we call creativity in much the same way as an invention is or a fantastically coded piece of software is. So creativity is the engine which we push our skills in one end and we get products out the other. And so understanding how the engine works is incredibly important because depending on what your skill set is and what the products are that you want, you need to understand how creativity works or you may not actually get anywhere. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so these, these four things being, you know, having mental quiet, being slightly inward looking, a little, little happy and not trying too hard. Mm. Um, where do you find people, where do you start with people across those four things? You know, what, what do you tend, what, what's the start of the journey for yeah. people here? Well, my first question is, and I'll ask you, Richard, where are you when you get your best ideas? Very often the shower. I mean, that's right. almost a cliche, right? right. Very often yeah. the shower. So, so let's run the shower through the four conditions. Um, mental quiet? Absolutely. You're in a soundproof cabin while falling water, not much going on upstairs. Um, are you inwardly looking? Well, yeah, because there's not much visual stimulus. So there's no one else with you. So uh, great. Slightly happy? Definitely. It's warm. It's comfortable. Not trying too hard? Well, I'm assuming you've been showering most of your life, so you're probably not trying too hard. In other words, your rational monkey, busy, busy, busy brain is kind of parked, which allows your unconscious, your subconscious to pop surprising thoughts uh, in front of your mind's eye. And once you understand that, you begin to see that there are so many opportunities for doing this, you know, walking the dog, doing the ironing, doing the washing up, 
uh, you name it. But almost every other activity we engage in does not conform to those four brain states. So if you need to be creative to solve problems, to improve processes, to even come up with new products, you need to make sure that you're reserving time where you can get into that brain state. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and of course, it does go against the, the grain. And I can see where you reference corporate structures. It does go against the grain for how most of us, most, how most of us experience corporate life. Yeah, busy, 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 busy. If you're not busy, you're not reliable. You're not efficient. You're not a good worker. You know, you've got to be constantly producing, 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 producing. There's no space for anything else. Right. And how do you how do you tackle that then? Because I'm guessing a lot of the people who you train don't have that much agency over their own schedule, or do you? Or do they? I mean, well, this is one of the reasons why I kind of switched from starting out with workshops and trying to get into companies to to train teams to think more creatively and and switched over to doing keynote speaking where I can have uh, a more immediate access to a larger group of people because what you say is exactly true you know, team a arrives we spend a day together they walk out inspired excited they go to their desk and the next day the manager's like why are you staring into space not working um, it it you know it's not going to work if it doesn't come if it's not company-wide if it's not the way we are working so my approach now is to try and activate as many people higher up the food chain to be able to get them to at least understand what's going on here and why things like innovation factories and having an innovation team or a hub just doesn't work when you silo it off in the corner when in actual fact there should be time for innovation built into every single employee's day and you know that's not something one team can decide to do so it's got to come from the top. Right. That's, that's fascinating. I mean, two, two reflections on that. One is a, a, an oil company executive who um, made it a point to spend a good part of every morning reading the entire paper. Uh, and, he, and he did that because he felt like that's where he got his, you know, his best ideas. And that would definitely fit your, your preconditions. Um, Absolutely. Um, but, but I think that's instructive because that's somebody who is very senior and probably does have a lot of agency over their schedule. Yeah. Um, and that's not, of course, not true of all companies, but uh, it, it uh, certainly can be true that it, the more higher up, the more agency you have. Um, so what are some examples then of some of the companies you've worked with who have success, successfully made a shift in this direction and what have been the benefits of them having done so? Well, mostly at this stage, um, I've been speaking to uh, startups and scale-ups, and um, the biggest benefit has been the actual, um, what's the right word for this? Uh, I don't want to say team camaraderie, but uh, kind of harnessing the combined intellectual capital of everybody involved. Um, you know, if you want to improve your beer delivery system, you, you shouldn't be talking to the engineers or, or even the marketing guys, and you certainly shouldn't be asking management. You should be asking the guys on the trucks who are lugging crates of bottles of beer into, into bars. Um, and so if you don't have structures in place where you can't access the intellectual capital of everybody along the value chain, quite often you're going to make decisions and try and innovate on things that aren't based on the actual situation on the ground. So with startups and scale-ups, that's a lot easier to achieve because there's a lot fewer people. Um, and I'm sure everyone's by now heard the anecdote of the, I, I, don't, I don't even know if it, which one it was, but the, someone like Johnson & Johnson, right? They're trying to figure out how to sell more baby powder. Um, and the meeting's over and the CEO is still hanging out in the meeting room. The cleaning lady comes in and she's bustling around and she kind of looks at all of the things on the walls and the drawings. And she asks the CEO, oh, what are you doing? And he says, oh, well, we're trying to figure out how to sell my baby powder, but we can't figure out what to do. And the cleaning lady says, oh, now make bigger holes in the tops of the bottles. I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> and you know it's 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 ridiculously simple because it's not coming from an mba educated business thinking person it's just a, it's a user it's a practical hands-on day-to-day observation and so that's the power of 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 not insisting on all these boundaries of 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 
trying to access the intellectual capital of everyone involved in the value chain from start to finish. So that I've done really successfully with smaller businesses. Um, right. I'm but still... isn't, that, that isn't, isn't that a slightly different point? Because there's one point which is giving people the latitude to engage in creative thinking. And there's another, there's another point which is about harnessing you know, the collective um, you know, creative potential of the organization. Am I right? Well, yes, but you're doing the one so that you get the other, right? <laughs> Right. So if, if you set people free, if you give them time to think about the big picture and the overall situation, from their unique perspective, they will present you with a series of ideas or inputs. And once you join those together, like a series of dots, the chances of you finding a solution that is very based in actual experience is high compared to sending in some specialist consultant from outside to analyze everything on a rational level. Right. Uh, so, so a big part of this is not just asking people for their ideas, it's giving them also the space to think about. It. Yeah, and, and, and the license to actually say to the CEO, hey, I think I can solve that problem. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting how the same principles sort of emerge again and again. I'm just thinking back, you know, we've had a lot of people on the show talk about lean manufacturing and the Toyota mm -hmm. production system and how so much of uh, that philosophy is grounded in what you're talking about, giving people the space and the agency to think think through problems, especially those closest to, uh, to the product, closest to production. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. That kind of, yeah. I mean, that, that's what I find so fascinating about this whole thing about creativity, because it's kind of hard to say where it starts and where it finishes. And when you talk about Kaizen, you know, just do one little thing a little bit better each and every day, you know, the, the knock on effect is enormous. But you've got to be creative enough to think what you're going to improve every single day. You know? mm -hmm. So None of these things are really possible if we weren't creative as beings. Right, right. And how much, I'm interested in the, in the band background, right? Managing oh. a band. <laughs> yes, herding <laughs> cats. <laughs> so what can you say about, what did you learn about creativity, managing bands? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I did learn that, you know, a lot of what, rock and rollers get up to band members and musicians is crucial for creativity because what they do is they kind of step into their own world where they're not net constantly referencing what's going on around them. They're, they're, they're too busy being cool and they, they're very much living the life. You know, there's no uh, self-censorship. There's no internal judgment. It's just, this is what we are doing. And that's such a crucial part to being able to constructively be creative is to suspend judgment and you know when you're in a band you're a bit of a gang and you've got together and you really believe in what you're doing you do tend to suspend judgment you don't tend to use the outside world's measures on yourselves anymore so for me that was quite a quite a liberating thing to learn is that, you know it doesn't matter whether qualitatively you're fantastic or not as long as you really inhabit it and you live it because by doing that you will do it so much that you will get to a stage where you actually are really good um and it doesn't really matter where you start as long as you inhabit it and 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 show up every day you know it's like as woody allen has been known to say 80 percent of success is just turning up and you got to turn up all the time but you got to turn up authentically and and focused and with a sense of purpose and then remarkable things can happen Right. And there's something about distancing. I've never really, yeah, I've never really considered that, that the identity that a rock and roller creates for themselves, you know, just to, to the extent that it's differentiated from the mainstream is really important for the art, right? Because that gives you a space where you're not being influenced by the dominant paradigm or ways of thinking. Right. So on, on a practical level, what it's doing is, um, it's giving them access to a series of experiences and information that other people don't have. So that's what generates the novelty because not everyone's, you know, snorting Coke or focus and throwing TVs out hotel rooms. Um, when, when you, when you experience that and you start to talk about life from that perspective, it's new, it's different. So people are immediately a little bit more interested and a little bit more excited. And, you know, that's one of the really important things about, about innovation and creativity is that you've got, you've got to push a little bit further 
out the curve. You can't just stick to the same stuff that everybody's doing. You need a twist. And, and for a, a band person, you know, it's not nine to five, they're probably not even awake between nine and five. Um, they're interacting with a total different category of people to what you and I would in a, in a job. Um, and as a result, they're having day-to-day -day experiences which are fundamentally different from ours. And the longer you stay in that experience, that space, the more divorced your experience becomes from normal people. But when you're making art, you're constantly pushing artifacts back into that shared experience. And, and it's, it becomes this like weird feedback loop of, of creation and consumption and then recreation and consumption. And that, that aspect I found really, really intriguing. And, and it's quite hard to explain actually. Right. Yeah, you've got to divorce yourself, but you've got to reconnect in order to get the feedback. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that creative thinkers are really good at doing is snapping out of rational, logical, uh, straightforward thinking into this kind of dream free association, creative mindset. And then once they have an idea, switching back on the rationality and thinking, okay, practically, how are we going to do this? And then taking some very rational logical steps and then stepping back out to creative mode you know that's the part about creatives that sometimes freaks people out this this fact that they're not one or the other but they're kind of both but not always at the same time right yeah and, and that was your experience of, of band members you managed presumably is that they had to be both if they were one or the other they couldn't really succeed is that right that's it yeah if they spent too much time in the dream world they just couldn't get this their stuff together and they're always late and they're always messing stuff up and they just didn't really improve. But if they were too focused on the practicalities, they weren't, they were just a little bit too generic to cut through the clutter of all the other people who sounded exactly the same. Yeah. And we can't all become rock and roll. <laughs> no, no, we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but what, so what is the equivalent then for somebody who's, who's, who's working at a, a somewhat regular job? Like what's... Well, you know, you, you kind of come, you, it's, it's the rock star of the water cooler, you know. <laughs> the, person who's, the person who's got their finger on the pulse, who's the first one to try out the new technology, who, who, who helps somebody else over the bumps. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's someone who's, who's had diverse work experience that nobody else in that team has. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be the manager or the team leader. It's just, there's, you know, if you can reduce creativity to joining the dots, it's all about which dots you have uh, when it comes down to, to what kind of solutions you can come up with. So on a day-to-day -day reality, it's about reading outside of your discipline. It's about experiencing outside of your industry. That's what's going to give you a competitive edge. That's what's going to make you a rock star of wherever you are. Right. It's interesting. We had um, a, th a manager, I think, of John Hagel on the show, and he talked about getting to the edge, um, you know, where you're creating new knowledge with people at the, at the edges of your current organization or your current sphere of knowledge. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's always where the interesting stuff happens. And if you think about it, it's because you're stepping into uncertainty, ambiguity, where there is no right or wrong answer, because just no one really knows. And therefore, you're forced into a creative response because there is no ready-made answer. Right. But the other thing he he mentioned, which I noticed doesn't doesn't feature in your four um, conditions here, is passion. Yes. Like if you don't care, if you're not passionate, you're unlikely to be driven to explore that ambiguity to get into the great space. What's your take on that? Um, Look, passion is not required for you to be creative because you don't have to be particularly passionate about finding an alternative route home when your current route is blocked by roadworks. But if you want to make something of your creativity, passion is absolutely required. Um, you need to have a sense of purpose to weather the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune because, you know, because it's undefined, because you're at the edge when you're being really creative, there's going to be an awful lot of failure and things just not working out. So if you're not passionate or you're not led by purpose, all that failure will quite quickly beat you down into a bloody heap on the floor and you'll just slink off the stage. But if you're connected to passion and purpose, you can write those things off as, as school fees, build on those experiences, 
uh, and like Thomas Edison go, oh, okay, well, I've found 2,999 ways not to make a light bulb and, and, and carry on until you actually figure it out. Right. So you need the passion to turn that creativity into, you know, meaningful into advances. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. Um, and, 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 and both of those things aren't particularly promoted by corporations, right? Or even just small companies. I mean, we talk about corporations like it's only the big, big corporations that, that uh, yeah. are behaving this way. But I think it's true of all, all sizes of organisations. Firstly, that encouraging people to discover what their passions might be and how they might express them within the workplace. And then secondly, uh, allowing or encouraging people to create identities or spaces outside of the norm within an organization. I mean, but both of those are in pretty short supply in most of our yeah. organizational. And, and actually, I mean, but that starts at school. I mean, we, we're kind of educated out of it even before we get to the workspace. Right. You know, there's a test and there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer and, and that's it. And as long as you toe the line and play the game, you will be successful. And if heaven help you, if you don't, you know, if you're a, a geek or a, or a weirdo or, you know, what, whatever the requirements are over the day. Um, and so, and that, that culture is just magnified and escalated when you step into the workplace. Right. Yeah. And how was your experience in school? In South Africa, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in South Africa. So it was actually quite a sort of traditional British public school model. Um, I went to an all boys high school, which was extremely sports focused. Um, but luckily, I mean, you can't obviously see now, but I'm, I'm six foot two and weigh 100 kilos. I was a, a pretty nifty number eight. So school for me was fairly... And what's the number eight for people? Not familiar. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the eighth man in a rugby team. So, um, you know, for me, school was was great because I was one of those chameleons. I was good at sports. I did okay academically. I took part in the cultural activities and I'm the youngest of five kids. So I'm pretty socially adaptable. Um, so I pretty much loved school. It was just like a giant playground. I wasn't too much interested in the schoolwork, um, but you know, all the other stuff I loved, all the team sports and uh, you know, doing things like debating and public speaking and, and, and the school play and that kind of stuff. I, I really enjoyed it but mainly because I just didn't really take the actual schooling very seriously at all. Right. So you didn't get, well, it sounds like it was a good, a good educational environment. And that's, it seems like you did have plenty of spaces to express your, your creativity. Yeah. I think I'm, I was able to do that because essentially on the surface, I'd ticked all the boxes. So, you know, the fact that, you know, me and my mates were sniffing glue and bunking school and stuff on the quiet, nobody really kind of noticed because the, the noise we were making conformed. So the rest of okay. our behavior was not examined. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, presumably a, a, a switch somewhere in your head flipped for you then not to follow, I, I suppose, a traditional path and you to go down more of an artistic route. Yeah, and it's so lame. I guess, you know, somewhere along the line, early in high school, I discovered punk rock um, and started playing in bands. And by the time I finished school, I mean, you know, I, I'm finishing high school at the tail end of the apartheid era. Everything is changing really, really rapidly. And I grew up in a very suspicious and um, uh, suspect era where you learned very quickly that no, no voices of authority could be trusted, uh, that nothing you were being told was actually true or nothing was what it seems. And I think that attitude kind of kept me kind of right out of, this, out of the tracks that I may otherwise have run along. And also I changed high schools right towards the end. And if, if, you know, if anyone's ever done that, you, you'll know that all of a sudden you, 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 <laughs> you're an established person in a particular social dynamic and then you jump into a pre-established social dynamic and there's no place for you no matter no matter where you might have fit into the previous one and I think that experience also um, gave me a much more outsider kind of perspective which thanks to my interest in outsider culture like punk rock and what have you I kind of embraced as an identity and kind of disappeared down the rabbit hole with it right and became a punk rocker yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I hesitate to call myself a punk rocker now, um, but but in the sense of that sort of DIY punk ethos, like rule number one, there are no rules. Yeah. Right. And and you did you make a go of it? I mean, were you, uh, 
did you become a professional museum then? Museum, musician. <laughs> um, I made a go of it. In retrospect, not much of a go of it. Never practiced enough. Never really, really was any good. Um, mainly because I just honestly didn't practice enough. I, I think I was so invested in the myths of rock and roll. You just turned up and you rocked out and everyone loved you and it was cool. The notion that you had to spend hours on your instrument every day um, so that you knew, you know, so that your mechanical behavior became automated so that you could put on a show that never crossed my mind. It just didn't seem very punk rock to be practicing all day. So it all fell apart quite quickly. And, and I think that's pretty much when I turned into a manager rather than a band member. Okay. Right. And then you started managing bands. Yeah. yeah. And what was your parents' reaction to that? You know, they never actually said, um, I don't think they were particularly pleased, but you know, <laughs> I'm the late comer in the family, the youngest of five. I think they were just happy that I wasn't um, uh, overtly kind of falling into the abyss. Uh, and, and at least I was making a living and, you know, seemed semi-respectable. Right. But you did, you did get to the point where you're making a living as a band manager in, in is this still in South Africa? Yeah, this was all, all in South Africa. Yeah, I did. I had a, I had a, a small stable and uh, we were doing pretty well. I was doing a lot of music journalism at the same time. Massive conflict of interest, but anyway. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, considering that I had no clue what I was doing, it went pretty well. Right, right. No, that's uh, that's great. But uh, there must be something here, and you know, I think we could we could play the parallel between your your schooling and your family and and your uh, and a corporations. It sounds like your your school wasn't pushing you too hard, right, to be too conformant. And it sounds like your parents were relatively less so fair in terms of you pursuing this career. So there was enough latitude in your environment that you could you could find those creative spaces, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a very good observation. And I think, yeah, my mother sang in choirs. Um, my brother was winning poetry prizes and playing guitar. And um, there was always music in our house. And there was a lot of reading. Everybody read rapidly. Um, and I think those things also combined to give me access to information that otherwise I would not have had, which... Now that I look at it, it's like it's like train tracks. It inevitably led me to the place where I was as a young adult, leaving leaving home and leaving school. Right. So again, so you you got it's, you asked that brilliant question earlier. What you know, what dots do you have to connect? And it sounds like you yeah. have you had several alternative dots that others didn't have access to, perhaps that you could exploit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. You know, it's you know, it's I, I hate saying this because it sounds like I'm quoting the secret, but <laughs> on this level where, where, you, where it becomes about connecting disparate pieces of information in new ways, you begin to see how you really can start to change your world, your environment, your experience, and, and what you get. You know, it might not be easy. It might not happen overnight. But if you change what you're experiencing, you will change who you are. It's, 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 it's inescapable. Um, and on that level, it was kind of, predetermined that I was never going to go off and get my my law degree and become a corporate lawyer as was sort of my plan when I started university because of all the pre-existing differences in my experience right yeah and for those who don't know the secret re reference that's a well go on explain the secret for me. wow well the secret is the whole idea that you can essentially just by thinking in a particular way you can change your reality yeah I mean, and that's a fairly unflattering summary, but yeah, it's more or less it. <laughs> yeah, I have to try. So there's one part of that because I've watched it. And there's one part of it where the, the guy talks about, you know, imagining your empty car parking space and that will manifest your car parking space. <laughs> I've shouted at the secret more times than once for not fulfilling on my <laughs> empty car parking space dream. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's... Um... Yeah, but I, I, you know, I think there is some, some, some wisdom embedded in there, right? No, definitely. Because if you don't change your mind, you can't change the way you act. So, but for me, the part that conveniently gets left out of the secret often is that, like, okay, now you need to do something. You know, you need to act on these thoughts. You need to act on these uh, visualizations in a way that takes you one step closer. 
like even one minuscule step closer again you know back to toyota back to kaizen and lean just do one thing today and tomorrow another one thing but you can't just sit at home and think about it i've just never actually seen that work for anyone yeah you got to, you got to align your actions and I, i've always found with it as well i think i get the most value of that i suppose that I suppose, approach to achieving goals you might say which is yeah thinking about it but then um if i'm not feeling it you know if i if i don't get the whole body involved and and then take the steps yeah it doesn't it just doesn't really yeah. work so it, no, it, it doesn't, can't does it? just be a thought process yeah no i don't think so that's right yeah um so it, there still may be people listening to this and thinking yeah this is all very well um but i don't want to be an outsider yes I'm concerned about, you know, that's not my identity. Yeah. Is there space for people to be creative without being outside of the group? Absolutely. Um, I think that, I mean, and this is one of the reasons why together with my business partner, Alia Sundavar, we, we created the, the Playful Creative Summit, you know, in order to show that, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not all, all about whiz bang, weird kids, uh, outsider genius types, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's just about getting what you want out of life by, by connecting to your sense of purpose, and then taking and thinking, conceiving and making the steps that lead you towards that target. So, you know, you know, not everyone has to be 50 years old and have a stupid haircut and, 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 and you know, run around doing strange stuff. Um, that would, that would be boring if everybody was doing it. The whole point is that you need to be doing something that connects to you, to your identity and to your passion. And because of the way our world works, you sometimes need to be quite creative to even make that possible. So mm -hmm. for me, it's not about the outsider part. That just happens to be my perspective. It's much more about the self-fulfillment part. Right, yeah, makes sense. Good, well, um... It's been a fascinating conversation. It certainly helped me to reframe a little bit this this concept of, of what it means to be creative and what our access to it is. Um, I've enjoyed it. And for people who want more uh, for, in terms of you and your perspective, where should they go? Well, there's two places at the moment which are good places to go. The first, of course, is my website, davidchislett.com, nice and easy. And the second one is the playfulcreativesummit.com. Uh, it only takes place in April next year, but we're always sharing information. Um, so that'll be April 2021. In person? Um, no, it'll, it's most of it's pre-recorded, but we will have live sessions and it will feature people who are using play and creativity every day in their work lives. Um, so it'll be some business people, it'll be some artists, it'll be, it's a wide range of people speaking about it. So if you're thinking, yeah, okay, whatever, the summit is a great way of you seeing this in action and, and hearing from people who are actually doing this kind of stuff for a living. Excellent. Okay. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. I've really appreciated the conversation. Great, Richard. Thanks for inviting me along. I've enjoyed it. Good. Uh, we'll put the links uh, into the description for the show. Uh, yeah, and thanks once again. All right. Thank you. Have a good thank evening. You.